So we've been looking at the rules of implication. And the rules of implication, in an important sense, take what we already know, and because of their relationships to each, between, the, say, the different propositions, between what we already know, because of their relationships, they tell us something new. Right? So from a conditional and the assertion of the antecedent, we can infer the consequent, that's what is ponens. From any assertion, right, we can infer a disjunct, a disjunction that contains that assertion. So we take what we already know, and then we infer something new with the rules of implication. The, rule, the equivalence rules are slightly different. So like I said, equivalence rules are a little bit different. Implication, rules of implication, we're able to take what we already knew and infer something new. So they work pretty much just one way, right? From a, a conditional and the assertion of the antecedent, we can infer the consequent. We can't just take any proposition we'd like, so that's modus ponens working one way, but we can't go the reverse, right? You can't just take any proposition we like and infer, you know, a conditional and the assertion of the antecedent with a disjunctive introduction. Right? We could take a single proposition and infer a disjunction that contains that proposition. But it, it just doesn't work that way. I can't, it doesn't work the other way, right? I can't take a disjunction and infer just one of the disjuncts. Uh, rules of application give us something new with what we already knew. Equivalence rules don't give us anything new. The equivalence rules don't really tell us anything new because the formulas that we're able to switch out <laughs> uh, have the exact same truth values. So in other words, I mean, if you go back to the truth tables, uh, no matter the truth assignments you have for P and Q, um, the, the um, truth value of the compound propositions will be exactly the same. Uh, you know, for, since they have the exact same truth value, since there's really nothing new that, we're, that we know or we're, we're learning about these uh, formula, we can simply swap them out. Right. Um, they can they go in both directions. And so, for instance, one of the rules we're going to see is double negation. This the simplest equivalence rule. So, it just take any proposition, and we've seen a negation of a proposition. Well, if you negate the negation, right? So, minus sign, minus sign, proposition. Right, that proposition, that double negation, has the exact same truth value as the proposition. So you can just simply swap it out. And you can swap it out, swap it out in the middle of any formula, right? And it could be uh, the proposition that you swap out, or the part that you swap out, could just be part of it, a right? uh, part of a, you know, a larger complex formula, or, or it could be the whole thing. So uh, the equivalence rules are going to be different than the rules of implication. Rules of implication go only one way. With the rules of implication, you can't just swap things out, right? You can't swap out parts. But the equivalence rules, they go both directions, right? So with any double negation, you can just you can swap out for the for the single proposition. And for any single proposition, you can swap out the double negation, no problem. Right? Uh, so it goes both ways, and you can do it within parts of uh, a larger complex formula. And that's just fine. So with the rules of equivalence, we're able to swap out formula propositions with their logical equivalent formulas. Right? So one is as good as another in terms of truth value. Now sometimes the results might be surprising, but in terms of truth value, we're not learning anything new. Uh, that's, this is different from the rules of implication, because we're learning something new in terms of, you know, some, in a sense, something new with truth values with uh, these further propositions. Now since the rules of equivalence are different, especially in meaning, from the rules of implication, they are going to be different in their use and application within the proofs. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a few problems, you know, look at a few problems along the way with, with each of the rules and see how that's going to look. So these are the rules of equivalence that we're going to be using uh, in, in this course. Now, and there's a handful of them, um, and you're going to want to try and keep track of them, so, you know, except for notes or something like that. Um, I wouldn't try and do this from memory, if I were you.
Well, the first one we're going to look at is double negation. Now, I already mentioned that as an example. You know, double negation allows us to you know, swap out any proposition with its negated negation. <laughs> so, I'm outside. Here's a proposition. I am outside. Here's the negation. I am not outside. Here's the double negation. It is false that I am not outside. Okay. Uh, being outside is kind of one of those things you are, you aren't. <laughs> so uh, double negation allows us to swap out any proposition with this negated uh, negation. And, you know, this finally lets us do something that we probably thought was really obvious up to this point uh, with modus tollens. So let's, let's take a look at this problem here. So we have, uh, we have a uh, conditional, and it's a conditional negations. Right? And we have the uh, assertion of the consequent. Right? So you have if, if not Q, then not P. And we have P. And we're from this, we're supposed to infer Q. So how do we do this, right? Because right now, we, because so far we're just modus tollens, we weren't able to do this. Modus tollens allows us to take a proposition with a negation of its consequent and infer the negation of the antecedent. But we don't have a negation of its consequent here, right? The negation of the consequent would be not not P. That would be not not P. Well, uh, so we have our first two premises, right? Well, with double negation, we are now able to just swap out that P with not not P. Right, so we can put that in the, that third line there. And since we ha now have the negation of the consequent, right, we can infer the negation of the antecedent, which is not not Q. Now, since what we're looking for is Q, right, we're not, our work isn't done yet. But fortunately, our work is really simple. Now we just swap out Q for the not not Q. Now, double negation is probably the easiest of the equivalence rules to deal with. Um, so let's move on to the next rule. It's not the last time we see double negation. Now, either I'm walking over a bridge or I'm walking over a bridge. Also, I am walking over a bridge and I'm walking over a bridge. Might say I'm just repeating myself. Well, that's kind of the point of this next rule. Redundancy. From any disjunction where both disjuncts are the same proposition, we can just infer that proposition. And vice versa. You know, from any proposition, we can infer a disjunction of that proposition. Right? Uh, same thing with conjunction. All right, from any conjunction where each proposition, or both propositions are the same conjunction, conjunct, we can infer just that conjunction. So probably one of the ways that this is most readily applicable is when we have something like, you know, like this problem here, where we have dilemma. Uh, so far, every problem with dilemma dilemma that I've given you, uh, at least if I remember correctly, <laughs> you know, it's just resulted in another disjunction. And that's not bad. But what happens when each disjunction, or both, excuse me, both disjunctions are, are the same? So, you know, we have if P then Q and P then R then Q then R, and we need to infer R. Up to this point, we haven't been able to do that. Right? We have to infer the disjunction R or R. Well, you know, let's just quickly follow the steps through the lemma, because we've seen this before. All right, we have our three uh, premises. Well, you assume for the sake of disjunction, that's what AD means, you assume for the sake of disjunction the left-hand disjunct, and from that uh, we use the conditional if P then R to infer R, you know, two and four using modus ponens. Uh, then, so that, that half of the job is done. Let's assume the right disjunct, and the right disjunct is Q, and again, using that other conditional of Q then R, so, you know, three and six using modus ponens, we've got the other R, right? So then we have, now we have our disjunction R or R, right? R or R. And that's from the first premise where we get the disjunction. The fourth line where we assume the left-hand disjunct. The fifth line where we get the, you know, what we wanted to conclude from that left-hand disjunct. The sixth line where we assume the right-hand disjunct. And the seventh line where we infer what we need to infer for this, uh, 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 the right-hand disjunct. And then we cite that with the lemma. Right? So we've got our conclusion. Well, we're still looking for R. Well, now we can use the equivalence rule, right? And the equivalence rule comes in, and we're able to just 
reduce that down from R or R, because you know the way it is, at least one of these is true, right? Well, at least one of these is true, <laughs> then you know they're both R, well then we get to infer R. Right? So uh, with redundancy, we're able to take that disjunction down to just the single proposition. Now, you know, so far we've just been using these equivalence rules to kind of clean up the conclusion to get what we want. It's going to get more involved, right? So the, these are just introductory examples uh, to show you a little bit how they work. It is going to get more involved the further along we go, and I think we're going to see that uh, more and more when we get to the more complicated equivalence rules. Next one's commutation. Commutation, I mean, it looks obvious. So obviously we don't need to bother mentioning it, but there's reasons for it. So with commutation, whenever we have a disjunction or a, 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 a conjunction, right, we can swap the positions of each one. So if we have P or Q, we can infer Q or P and vice versa. If we have P and Q, we can infer Q and P or vice versa. Uh, so commutation allows us to swap this side. Notice conditional is not in this uh, rule, right? We can't just swap positions with a conditional and get the same thing. So don't confuse commutation uh, with conditions. So let's take a look, a look at a problem with this. Okay, so we have not not p. Hmm, I wonder if we can use double negation there, right? <laughs> we have not not p. Uh, and then if q then q or r, excuse me, and then the second premise, if either Q or P, then R, right? And so we need to infer R. Well, already, you're probably, probably going to need to have <laughs> more than one equivalence rule working here. That, that not not P is kind of a glaring thing, right? Uh, so, so as with all these problems, take a look at R. Or excuse me, take a look at the conclusion. That's R. And we want to be able to pull out that conclusion from the uh, premises. Well, where is it? Well, it's the consequent of a conditional in that second premise. Okay, cool. Right. So since it's the consequent of a conditional, we're probably going to use modus ponens to get it. So what's the antecedent of that conditional? It's Q or P. When you look at the rest of the premises, it's not there. But we do have that not not P. We have that not not P, and we also have the inference rule disjunction introduction. So that's probably where we're going to get that antecedent. Well, let's give it a shot. So first we'll take P, excuse me, you take the not not P, and with the equivalence rule of double negation, right, for that first line, we'll infer P. Right? And again, it could go both directions, but we're using one direction this time. Right? Well, so we got P, and we still need you know, the P or Q. Well, let's use double, excuse me, let's use disjunction introduction and infer that P or Q. Okay, great. But P or Q is technically not, uh, you're not exactly the same as that Q or P. I mean, it is and it isn't, right? Uh, it's exact same in truth value. Well, since it's the exact same in truth value, let's swap out, swap the positions of, of the P and the Q there and use Q or P with our equivalence rule. Right? So you say, well, it means the same thing. Well, of course it means the same thing. That's why we have the equivalence rule. I mean, that's the point of these equivalence rules to be able to state, you know, as explicitly as possible, this is the same thing. And it works out in the truth tables. Uh, they have the exact same truth value, so it's fine, right? It's fine. And probably also, and, and again, you have this rule specifically for disjunctions of the conditionals to emphasize the fact that we can't use these with, con, uh, um, excuse me, have this rule for disjunctions and, and conjunctions, disjunctions and conjunctions, but not with conditionals, right? We can't use the, this rule as it stands with a conditional. So now we have our, our Q or P. Well, then it's simply a matter of um, modus ponens at this point with line two and line five to infer R. Uh, so, you know, just to em maybe emphasize this fact, we can use this more than one equivalence rule in a proof. And as we'll see probably later on, you could use uh, the equivalence rule more than once <laughs> in a proof. Okay. All right, so that's uh, that example. Uh, that's, that's commutation. We could switch positions of the propositions for disjunctions and conjunctions. So this next rule, association, lets us deal with three disjunctions or three conjunctions, conjuncts, excuse me, at a time. 
So, so far, we, we really haven't been doing this. Our, oper uh, our logical operators only deal with two propositions at a time. Uh, but if we've got three disjuncts, association uh, will help us handle these three disjuncts. If we've got three conjuncts, association will help us handle them. We have to do it a step at a time, but it, you know, it, it'll let, help us handle these, uh, even though our operators only deal with two propositions at a time. So uh, let's take a look at how this, how this works. Right? So um, let's take a look at this problem. So we've got P, you know, we've got P or, and then the further uh, disjunction Q or R, okay? and we've got the conditional if uh, uh, P or Q, then S, and the third and a second conditional if R then S, and what we want to infer is S. So look at that conclusion S. Where do we find it? We find it as the consequent of two conditionals. And where do we find the antecedents? The antecedents are in that first premise, just not presented the right way, right? So we have, in that first premise, we have P as one disjunct, and then Q or R as the other disjunct. And it'd be great to be able to use delimit at this point to pull out that S, but I don't have P or Q as a disjunction. I don't have R as a disjunction. But wait, there's association. <laughs> so uh, let's first take that, that first premise, association, right? And uh, this allows us to take P or and the disjunction Q or R and infer P or Q disjoined to R. And it works both directions. Just keep that in mind. It can go both directions. So we've got, uh, now we've got the right disjunction to use dilemma. So we assume P or Q for the sake of dilemma and using that assumption and premise two, we're able to infer S. That's the left-handed part of the disjunction. Then we assume the right-handed part of the disjunction, assume R for the sake of disjunction, and we're able to infer S using uh, that conditional <coughs> in line three. So we got our S or S. Now notice the, the uh, citation. The citation is not the initial disjunction of premise one. Right. It's not. Uh, it's premise four. Now four is equivalent to one. But the disjunction we're using for dilemma is that premise is that uh, line four, not line one. So it's line four. Line five is where we assumed uh, the left-handed disjunct. Line six is where we inferred our S, what we're looking for from that left-handed disjunct. Line uh, seven is where we assumed the right-handed disjunct. Line eight is where we inferred made our inference from that disjunction. Right? So that's how we're able to infer S or S. And then now, using redundancy, which we already learned, we're able to just infer S. So that's one way that association could work. Let's look at another problem. That one dealt with uh, disjunctions. This one deals with conjunctions. Uh, so here we have uh, P conjoined to the conjunction Q and R. And then we simply have the conjunction P and Q. Uh, in, you know, uh, uh, part of a conditional is the antecedent. Um, and S is the consequent, and we need to infer S. This one's pretty straightforward. It's easy to find S in our premises. And we got P and Q as the antecedent, but P and Q, at least not explicitly, is, is there. But we do have that conjunction. So we take that conjunction, and again, using an association, we move right, the parentheses over, and now P and Q, the conjunction P and Q is conjoined to R. And so we separate out P and Q using conjunction elimination, and from that, in the conditional in premise two, we're able to infer S. And two pretty straightforward uses of association. But wait, there's more. Now, let's take a look at a third problem. So now we have just a single premise, P and Q. And from this, we're supposed to infer P or R disjoined to a further proposition, Q or R. P or Q. P or R, either P or R, or either Q or R. <laughs> it's a little cumbersome to say in English, which is probably why you know, having this notation is a good thing. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, looking at the conclusion, you might notice that R is to be found nowhere in the premises. we got P or Q, but we don't have R anywhere in the premises. Well, that, that gets a little strange, right? Uh, how are we supposed to uh, deal with that then? Um, if, you know, if we got something out of nowhere, right, there's only two rules that let us deal with something out of nowhere. Well, disjunction introduction is one of them, and uh, 
conditional proof is the other, right? Conditional proof, we're able to assume the antecedent to infer the consequent, and that allows us to infer the conditional. Well, disjunction int introduction allows us to infer disjunction from any given premise. Okay. So since it's just purely out of nowhere and we're not dealing with the condition, well then yeah, we're probably dealing with disjunction introduction. So let's take the initial prop premise, P or Q, and then what do we do? Well, we, from that, we infer just, uh, P, the disjunction P or Q or R, right? That's our inference from disjunction introduction. Well, don't we need two R's? Well, yes we do, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so we need two R's, well then we're able to uh, use that R and swap out the single R for a disjunction of R or R using redundancy. So this is the first time we've got like that little swap out just within, uh, just within part of a complex proposition. This works for equivalence rules. This does not work for rules of implication. Don't try to swap things out using rules of implication. Only the equivalence rules, right? Only the equivalence rules. This does not, so with the equivalence rules, we can swap out uh, these parts. This does not work for the rules of implication. We can't swap it out with the rules of implication, only with the equivalence rules, all right? So now what do we do? Well, we've got a kind of a complex set of parentheses here. So I'm just going to show you the next move. It's that line four. Now, this might look confusing, but uh, this works using association. Right? Where, uh, uh, you know, the right, most right-handed R there is treated as one of the disjuncts. And the left, you know, so then we got that complex, uh, that, that P or Q, or R, that's treat, that P or Q is treated as the left mode system. Well, we could just, you know, double the parentheses over around that, right? So we've got the P, we've got the P or Q as one disjunct, disjoined to R, and then that whole disjunction is also disjoined to R. Right? Well, now we use a uh, good old association again, and this time we move the parentheses around Q or R. So we got P as one disjunct, then we've got the Q or R, next to it. We still got that last R dangling out. Sure wish we could move it on over to the other side, and then that way it'd be really easy to use association. But wait, we can. After all, we have commutation. Commutation allows us to switch positions to disjunctions. So we switch the R with the other, you know, complex property of the P of the Q of the R, right? So we switch that around in line six. And then again, using association, we're able to move those parentheses out uh, to uh, uh, excuse me, the parentheses out uh, to conjoin R to P, right? And then using commutation just one more time, switch positions of P or R. So now we have P or R conjoined to Q or R. That was a lot of equivalence rules, but sometimes that's the way it works. Let's look at one more problem. This time, this should look kind of familiar, but instead of the disjunctions this time, now we got the conjunctions, right? Now we got the conjunctions. So this problem looks a lot like the disjunctions, except now we got conjunctions, right? So you can probably figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> so we got the P and Q conjoined to R, and we want to infer P and Q and P and R. Excuse me, P and R and Q and R. Excuse me, P and R and Q and R. Okay. So how are we going to go about doing this? Well, we got the initial premise, P and Q conjoined to R. Um, but we sure need two R's. Well, think about this. If you ever need two instances of the same proposition, this is where redundancy comes in handy, right? Can we just simply double it up, right? Uh, so now, so in line two, what we're able to do is we get, get the conjunction of R and R from the single instance. And again, since it's, it's one part, using the equivalence rule, we can swap it out. We could do that with equivalence rules. We can't do, it, do that with rules of implication. Okay, so now again, using association, we've got... The premises around P and Q and R, and that last and R is on the outside. And using association again, instead of P and Q conjoined, uh, conjoined to R, now we got P conjoined to Q and R. And we still got the R hanging out the other side. Well, we need that R back over on the other side at, this, at the front. Well, to get that in the front, then we use commutation. So we move that on over uh, in line, uh, uh, line five. Line six, we need the parentheses around R and P. So with association, again, we can have the parentheses around R and P, but we need P and R to switch places. Now, now we can uh, use that, uh, do that using commutation again. So now we got commutation again. So uh, this time, you know, here, here's, here's something fun. Not a single inference rule is used in this proof. 
So this is what I, I was saying earlier. Uh, we might get surprised by some of those results with equivalence rules. But technically speaking, it's the same exact truth values. If you took these two propositions, or the premise and the conclusion, and put them on the truth table, you'll have exactly the same truth values. And the equivalence rules reflect that and allow us to swap out these premises. So that's, so, so far we got double negation, redundancy, commutation, and association. Now we start to enter some of the really fun stuff. So, so far with uh, commutation and association, we're dealing only with uh, one kind of logical operator. Right. It might be several instances of it, but only kind of one, one kind of logical operator. All, either all disjunctions or all, or, or all conjunctions. Okay. This next rule, distribution, deals with, deals with a mix of two operators, and that's with a mix of conjunctions and disjunctions. Right? So the first way to, that we're going to think about this is when we got a conjunction where one of the conjuncts is a disjunction. And when that's the case, we can distribute. Right? So the right-handed conjunct is a disjunction. We can distribute the left-handed disjunct, excuse me, the left-handed conjunct to the two disjunctions. So if I got P conjoined to the disjunction Q or R, from, that's equivalent to a disjunction. And the disjunction is P and Q, and let's say the disjunction is Q or R, that's equivalent to a disjunction P and Q or P and R. And so the idea is at least Q or R are true, is true, and we already know that P is true, so we can refer to disjunction. Now, either P, Q is true or R is true. Well, we can conjoin Q or R in this case, or could you conjoin P or R in that case, right? So this also works the other direction, right? From a disjunction where each disjunct is a conjunction, and each and in each of the conjunctions you have the same premise, we can pull out. Um, that uh, pull out that conjunct. So it works in both directions. The other way distribution works is when we're dealing with a disjunction. So we have the left-handed disjunct, and it's just joined to a conjunction. So we got P or Q and R. Right? Well, we can right, distribute that disjunct over the conjuncts. So you got P and Q or uh, P and R. So let's see this with a homework problem. So we've got two premises here. First premise is a disjunction, P disjoined to Q and R. Gee, I wonder if we're going to use distribution there. <laughs> Second premise is P or Q. And that, that's, a, that's the antecedent of a conditional with S as the consequent. And the conclusion is S. Okay, we're, well, we already identified right, S as the conclusion. We, need, we already identified where S is in the premises. So it's, it's as the consequent of that conditional. To get that consequent out, we need the antecedent, P or Q. Well, P or Q is not present. Now, one way, uh, I'm just going to be honest, one way to do this, uh, well, yeah, yeah, so we think maybe that one way to do this is to uh, do a dilemma, right? But we don't have any conditionals that allow us to infer that Q and R to get to S, right? We don't have any of that. So we need to use distribution in this case, all right? So we've got line three, it's where we use distribution. So from that disjunction, we're able to refer a conjunction. P or Q can join to P or R. And from that conjunction, we could pull out P or Q using conjunction elimination. And then it's a simple matter of that premise two, right, with the conditional there, premise two, to infer S using modus ponens. All right, so that one's pretty straightforward. Let's try another problem. All right, it's a little bit longer this time. This time we've got a conjunction with P in and it's conjoined to Q or R. And now we have two conditionals, P and Q implies S, and then P and R imply, also implies S. And the conclusion is S. All right, well, where's the conclusion? That conclusion S is as a consequent of two conditionals. Now, this, this can be a clue, right? <laughs> if there's two conditionals there, maybe, maybe, probably, you know, the good chance that you could be using dilemma at this point, right? But we don't have a disjunction of P and Q or P or R. P, uh, P and R, excuse me, P and Q or P and R. Well, we kind of do with that first premise, right? 
with that first premise, we could distribute that P across Q and R and we get a, a nice big disjunction, right? And so that's what we have in line four, P and Q is just joined to P and R. All right, great. Well, now it's just a simple matter of using dilemma. So we assume for the sake of dilemma P and Q, and from that assumption and that second premise there, we're able to infer S. So that job's done. Let's get the right hand, let's use the right-handed disjunct. So we assume P and R for the sake of dilemma on the right-hand side. And from that, using that third premise, we're, uh, yeah, third premise, we're able to infer S again. And since we assumed S from both of these disjuncts using, you know, using, assuming that they're true, right? We're able to infer the disjunction S or S. Well, we just need the S. Well, gratefully, we have uh, redundancy. We can take that S or S and reduce it down to R. So we used um, two equivalence rules there. All right, so that's uh, uh, distribution. And so far, we we've been dealing just with negations, uh, conjunctions, and disjunctions. Let's take a look at conditionals. Okay, now we're getting to an equivalence rule that deals with the conditionals and a conjunction. And that is uh, uh, exportation. Exportation might look a little confusing. So let's think of it this way. Let's start with the left-hand side. So we've got a conditional where the antecedent is a conjunction. Uh, now, if you remember, right, a conjunction is true just in case both conjuncts are true. So in order for that antecedent to infer the consequent, now we need both conjuncts. Well, it doesn't matter whether both conjuncts are true at once or true in sequence, right? <laughs> this sort of thing doesn't really happen in logic. It's just whether they're true or false. So with a conjunct, or excuse me, with a conditional, where the antecedent is a conjunction, right, we can pull out the left-handed side conjunct as its own antecedent. And then the consequent is a conditional with the other conjunct as sufficient for R. So we already, so the idea is, well, we already have P, we know P is true. Well, now we gotta infer Q in order to, or we gotta have Q in order to infer R, right? So that's, that's one way, I mean, one, one direction. The other direction, right, we got a conditional, we're just P, and the uh, consequent is another conditional, Q or R. Well, that's equivalent if we have both P and Q, right? If we have both P and Q, it's not hard to infer R right after that. So that, that's exportation. Um, hopefully that it's pretty obvious what's happening. Um, if not, you can sit down with a truth table and see that the, these are in fact uh, equivalent. These are in fact equivalent. So let's look at some homework problems. So we've got two premises, uh, P or, you know, a P, excuse me, P implies Q or R and we've got a pretty long conjunction, P and Q and S, right? and what we need is R. Okay, well we need R, and where is R in our premises? Well, it's a consequent and a conditional that is itself a consequent. <laughs> so we don't need the conditional, we need that whole consequent, we need the consequent of that conditional. Well, in order to get that, right, we're gonna need both P and Q. Okay, so that, that brings us to the second premise. We got P and Q right there, all right. Well, let's go ahead and pull out that P and Q. Now, yeah, we could do this using conjunction elimination and a couple of different steps. Okay, you, you can, but yeah, hey, let's use equivalent sort, just as long as we're here. <laughs> so let's use commutation on, on that line two, right? So line three, we got commutation, and then we got P and Q as one conjunct, and then S is the other. Now let's use conjunction elimination to get that P and Q out. So now we get, we get the P and Q out, great. Now again, we could just you know, pull it apart and then use modus ponens twice to, to get the R. But hey, since we got the equivalence rules, let, let's make it a little easier on ourselves and let's short down our work a little bit. So let's use that line one. On line one, let's use exportation. And with exportation, we're able to put P and Q as the antecedent and then S as the consequent, uh, uh, excuse me, R as the consequent, right? R as the consequent. And now we have the really easy job of simply inferring R using that conditional line five 
with the with the antecedent that conjunctive antecedent line four, and now we're able to look, uh, infer R using lines four and five. Okay. So that you know, one way to think about it, it shortens down a little bit of work here. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's try another one. Okay. And this works a little bit differently. This time we're not trying to get R out. We're just trying to get the the consequent that the QRR out, right? So that's our that's our problem here. QRR. Well, uh, again, look at the uh, uh, conclusion, QRR, and that's not contained as a, in the premises, it's not contained as a conditional end of itself. But we got P and Q infers R. Okay, well, it's sufficient for R. Well, let's use exportation. Let's use exportation on that first premise. So we got P is sufficient for QRR. And what do you know? We got P in line two. So from that, using modus ponens, we're able to infer if Q then R. Uh, another little handy trick to keep in mind here, maybe commutation is going to come up. So maybe the uh, conditional isn't going to be P and Q, but it's going to be Q and P. Right? So maybe it needs commutation to switch it around. That could happen. Right? Just, just keep that in mind. Right? Whenever you got conjunctions and disjunctions, that's a handy occasion to use commutation. Right? Or you know, at least that's in my mind. It's like, hey, I want to make it use commutation there. So just keep that in mind. All right. Uh, so that's one infer that's one equivalence rule using uh, conditionals. Let's look at another one. Okay. So exportation dealt with conditionals and conjunctions. This next one just deals with uh, conditionals. Now, you remember with commutation, right, we could just simply swap the positions of disjunctions, or disjuncts and conjuncts, right? If you have a disjunction, you could swap the positions of the disjuncts. If you have a conjunct, you could swap the position of the conjuncts. And I said that, you know, let's not do this with conditions. You can't do this with conditions. And you can't, right? At least not simply. We can do a little swapping with conditionals, but the truth values are not going to remain the same. So, if we have a conditional, right, I could swap the antecedent for the consequent, but I have to negate them. Right? I have to negate them. If I've got if p then q, I can swap their positions. But if I do so, then I got to have not q implying not p. Right? Uh, if I've got a conditional of negations, I can swap them. Right? And in swapping them, I just have the, the, the simple assertions. I don't have the negations. Uh, say this is called contraposition. Contraposition. We're able to swap the entity for the consequent, but negations are involved. Right? Um, if you're swapping assertions, the swap results in negations. If you're swapping negations, the result, uh, the result is assertions. Right. Okay. So let's look at a, a problem with this. So we've got P and Q. Uh, is sufficient for R, and what we want to infer is, uh, and, sorry, and we got P, right? and we got P, but what we want to infer is, if not R, then not Q. So this should look a little familiar, right, because we just dealt with something like this with the last problem. Mm -hmm. So we got that P and Q, and already that P and Q, that should send up a little red flag and say, aha, I can use exportation on that. <laughs> um, and look at the conclusion, I got, if not R, then not Q. Well, that, that uh, conditional is not anywhere in there, but we've got you know R as a consequent in the first premise, so probably you should be already be on alert. Probably going to use exportation here, and what do you know? That's what we do. Line three, we export that P out. You get that P out of there. Well, then using lines two and th uh, two and three, excuse me, yeah, using lines two and three modus ponens, we're now able to infer if Q then R. Okay, great. But I need not R, if not R, then not Q. All right. Well, this is where exportation comes in handy. Right? Now we can infer that, if not R, then not Q, using exportation. So that's a little bit of a simple example using exportation. It can get more complicated pretty fast. We'll see that. We've already seen an equivalence rule uh, involving a conditional 
uh, conditionals and conjunctions. Uh, we also have equivalence rule involving disjunctions and conditionals. It, it, although, just to be clear, it's not, you know, distributing a <laughs> disjunction over the antecedent and the consequent. It's not, it's not like that. Uh, rather, it's that every conditional is equivalent to a disjunction. Okay. So, we have a condition if P then Q. And this is equivalent to a disjunction of not P or Q. Now, this might look strange, but remember our truth conditions for a conditional. A condition is true just in case either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. Well, that is contained in that disjunction. Similarly, we have that with a, a disjunction. If you have a disjunction, the negation of the, in the negation of the antecedent, that excuse me, and the negation of the of the left hand disjunct, that is equivalent to a conditional, right? Where that left handed disjunct, that negation in the left hand disjunct is a now an assertion, and that uh, implies Q. And this is just you know this is basically disjunctive syllogism, right? Disjunctive syllogism. If you have the negation of the left handed disjunct, the right handed disjunct follows. So now, you know, keep in mind commutation, this should be in the background. If we have at least one negated conjunct, that's a commutation away of being turned into a conditional using uh, material implication. So let, let, let's look at a, a homework problem with this. Okay, so we just simply have P, right, the antecedent, and now we imply, uh, now from that we infer if Q then P. I mean, this looks kind of weird, uh, but it, it's really not as strange as you might think. Um, so it, 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 how do we do this? Well, we have our, you know, we have our P, right? That's our premise. Well, from this, we can infer, uh, using disjunction introduction, we can infer P or not Q, right? Remember, a disjunction introduction, we can in, have a disjunction with anything that we like, and that's fine, right? Well, now we have not Q as our disjunction. There's a rabbit. I don't know. Y'all can't hear it on this microphone, but there's a rabbit over there. I can hear him moving around. Uh, or some little critter. Okay. So uh, so we have P just joined to not Q. Well, let's use commutation, right? Uh, conditional is just a commutation away. <laughs> commutation. Now we have not Q or P. Not Q uh, disjoined to P. So now we can use our material implication on that, on that disjunction to get FQ then P. Okay. Let's take a look at another problem. All right, so here's, here's an, another version of this, right? So now we have P by itself. And this implies if not P, then not Q. So this should kind of already make sense, right? We've already seen a version of this with the previous problem. Because now we just pretty much just followed those steps, right? We've already seen how to get if, key then, if Q, then P. Well, remember good old contraposition. Right, contraposition allows us to swap places with the antecedent and the consequent, but then have the negation in there. So we got our line one, right? That's our assertion. From this, this should look real familiar, right? Use disjunction introduction to infer a P or not Q. Commutation, switch places. Now we got not Q or P. From this, using material implication, line three with material implication, if Q then P. And now we apply contraposition to get if not P, then not Q. Right. So yeah, this is something to keep in mind. If you've got a conditional of negations, contraposition might be in your future. <laughs> or if you've got just simply, if you've got, so you know, it works both ways, right? If you've got a conditional and the conclusion contains those same parts of the conditional, but they're negated in their different places, yeah, contraposition is probably in your future. If you've got uh, conditional of negations, and in the conclusion you've got uh, the conditional, they're swapped and no longer negated. Yeah, contraposition is probably in your future. Okay. Probably in your future. Okay. So that that was that was kind of a variation of this, that that second problem is kind of variation of the first one. Okay. So now we just have P or Q, P and Q. Let's look at this another problem. We got P and Q, and now we got a conjunction of dis, uh, of conditionals. Hmm. That's strange. Well, think about it. <clears throat> Every conditional is equivalent to a disjunction. So you can really look at that conclusion 
it's a conjunction of conditionals, but that's also equivalent to a conjunction of disjunctions. Haven't we seen something before that allows us to distribute a disjunction over conjuncts? <laughs> there it is, right? There it is. Okay. So, uh, you know, so we're, we're, we've got distribution in mind, right? We're pretty sure we're going to use distribution here. All right, well, let's take our first premise. We've got P and Q. Well, we, we still need that R, right? We're pulling R out of nowhere. Well, if you pull an R out of nowhere, chances are you're using disjunction introduction, right? Okay, so we've got uh, that P and Q disjoined to not R. All right, great. And we say not R, you know, just keep that in mind. If you're going to have what you're pulling out of the air as an assertion, you, you, you need to... If you use a disjunction introduction, you need to introduce a negation of that same thing. Okay, so we've got, we've added on our disjunction. Okay, well, that not R is in the wrong place. We need it on the other side. Well, that's where commutation comes in play. So commutation allows us to move that negated disjunct to the other side, and that's what we do in line three. Now we can distribute, right? So we distribute that R across the conjuncts, and what we get is a conjunction of disjunctions, not R or P, conjoined to not R or Q. Right. <clears throat> okay, so the next step, uh, you might think, well, we'll just use material implication on both. No, we're not going to do that. If you can use an equivalence rule, use it on one, one part at a time, right? So we'll use the equivalence, we'll use material implication on the left-handed conjunct. It's worse, it's best, it's best to work from left to right when applicable. Work left to right when applicable. So we use material implication on that left-handed conjunct, and now we got the conditional R than P conjoined to the disjunction, not R or Q. All right, well, we need the other con uh, conditional. So now we use material implication again to get that, not, uh, to uh, uh, turn that disjunction into a conditional. So now we have our conclusion, if R then P conjoined to if R then Q. Right. Uh, easy peasy. All right, let's look at another homework problem. Okay. This looks interesting. Now we got just a disjunction, right? and the disjunction, we, uh, uh, we're turning that disjunction into a disjunction of conditions. Right? Now that R is still coming, so you look at the, the conclusion, right? R then, if R then P is disjoined to if R then Q. Well, again, that R is coming in nowhere, so we're probably still using disjunction introduction. Except this time we're not distributing conjunctions over disjunctions or disjunctions over conjunctions, right? It's all disjunctions. So, hmm, what are we going to do, right? We can't, because we can't distribute disjunctions over disjunctions. At least not with a rule. But we can do it with the other equivalence rules that we have. Remember association, that's how we're able to get disjunctions, you know, <laughs> moved around <laughs> within parentheses. Uh, and we need two R's then. Well, if we need two R's, that's where redundancy comes in, right? Now, now you start to see where some of these problems uh, can get complicated pretty fast. So first things first, right? So we have our P or Q. Well, let's go ahead and disjoin that to not R. That's going to be our uh, big thing, right? Disjoin it to not R. Okay, second, uh, so next after that, use redundancy. We had not R before. Well, let's just join not R to not R. <laughs> we could do that. Right? Okay, so then by association, we're moving around the parentheses. By association, we're moving those parentheses out, around to, in, uh, uh, to you know, disjoin P or Q to, to one of the not R's, and the other not R is just disjoined all off on the side. Then by commutation, we move those around, move that, that not R on the left-hand side of that P or Q. And by association, again, we get the parentheses uh, for around one not R to the Q, right? Then by uh, this time, we just got a simple association move over Right, just moving the parentheses over uh, around the Q and the not R. Right? And one little bit of commutation, switching the place between the R and the Q, the not R and the, not, and, and, and the Q. Right? In line nine, now this is where we apply material implication on each part, kind of twice in a row. The same thing with, like, with the computation, the association. You can't just use one line of association to just move it all the way. No, you got to do it one step at a time, right? You do it one step at a time. So, uh, Material implication on the left-handed disjunct, followed by the material implication on the left on the right-handed disjunct, and now we got our conclusion. Right. I want to pay attention to these examples. This shows you kind of the ninja moves we could take with association and commutation. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at one more problem. This time we're starting with a conditional, 
And what we're inferring is a not only uh, not only is the consequent now and the antecedent and negated, hint, 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 contraposition, but it's conjoined to another negation. Well, how does that happen? How do we get a, how do we start with a conditional and get a, conjun a conjunction as the antecedent? Hmm. That looks interesting. Well, one step at a time, right? So first of all, we need the antecedent and the consequent, right, and in the in the right order and negated. So let's go ahead and use material implication on that on that P and Q. So we got Q and P. If not if if not Q, then not P. Right? So where are we going to get that R? Well, remember, if we're pulling something out of the air, disjunction introduction is a nice choice. So let's just join that to R. Now we're destroying it to R this time because we need the negation of R. Right? We need the negation of R in the antecedent. If you need a negation in the antecedent, using disjunction introduction to get this, if you need a negation, then you infer, then you uh, introduce the assertion. And maybe, maybe, maybe double negation is in your future. Okay. So we got R there. All right. So now we, uh, but it's in the wrong place. So let's use commutation, swap the R on the left hand, uh, to the left hand side. And it's in the right place, but it's uh, the wrong uh, it's, it's the wrong value. It's not a negation. Well, let's go ahead and double negate that bad boy. <laughs> we'll double negate that R. And again, you know, just look, at, we can apply the equivalence rule just to one part of the whole thing, of the complex proposition, not just, uh, not, not, not the entire proposition. Okay? So we got that uh, double negated R. Uh, well, let's use material implication on this thing. We got a disjunction, right, with a negation. It's a double negation, but it's still a negation. Yeah. <clears throat> so now that's equivalent to if not R, then, uh, if not Q, then not P. Well, now we can use exportation. That's how we get that uh, conjunction in the antecedent. Use exportation, and we can join together not R and not Q to infer not P. All right. So uh, now we're seeing, right, we're, we start adding up these rules together, and it can, uh, it can be a lot. <laughs> it can be a lot, a lot. So just keep this in mind when using these rules of equivalence. It, it, keep this in mind with the rules of implication. It's rarely going to be a single step from the premises to the conclusion. You probably got to use many steps in between. Right? So you have to kind of chart out that path. And the way you do that is you look at the conditional, excuse me, you look at the uh, conclusion, find the conclusion and the premises. Uh, that's probably not going to give you the whole story. <clears throat> one part of the story, and then look at the premises and see which uh, rules of implication and which equivalence rules are going to be applicable to those premises uh, to get to that conclusion. You kind of have to work both directions, from conclusion to premises and from premises to conclusion. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so we've had one equivalence rule with negations, but it wasn't really mixing with much else. Uh, now let's look at an equivalence rule with conjunctions and equivalence rule with disjunctions. Right. Now, suppose we have a negation of a conjunction. Right. Now you might think that you could just like, you think mathematics, right? Well, it's negated, so I can negate every number within the parentheses, and that doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Uh, the negation is spread out over both uh, conjuncts, right? But instead of a conjunction, now, now you have a disjunction. So when you negate a conjunction, you're saying it's false that both of these. It's false that uh, I am outside and I am eating lunch. It's false that both of those. Uh, well, that just means that at least one of those is false, right? It's, you know, I, it's false that I'm eating lunch. I'm outside, but it's false that I'm eating lunch. So when you negate a conjunction, what, that's equivalent to a disjunction where both disjuncts are negated. And, and vice versa, if you have two disjuncts that are negated, that's equivalent to a conjunction where the entire conjunction is negated. Okay. Now, if you have a negation of a disjunction, right? disjunction says at least one of these is true. Well, if that's negated, then both are false. Both are false. So if you have a negation of a disjunct, uh, that's equivalent to 
a conjunction where each conjunct is negated. And if you have a conjunction where each conjunct is negated, that's equivalent to a disjunct, that's that, a disjunction that's negated. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at some problems with this. This is De Morgan's. De Morgan's. Okay, so we've got P, or we've got, we've got, we got not P, and we've got not Q, both as two premises. And the third premise is if R, then uh, P or Q. Okay. So already this looks suspicious, because now we're pulling R apparently out of nowhere. Right? And we want to, the conclusion is not R. Well, that conclusion isn't, uh, well, it's found, sorry, it's not out of nowhere. It's found in the antecedent of the third premise. Sorry, it's found in the antecedent of the third premise. Okay. Well, if it's the antecedent of a third premise, chances are we're using modus tollens. And to use modus tollens, what we, what we need is not P or Q. Right? We've got to negate the consequent as not P or Q. Well, how do we get that? Because we don't have not P or Q. Uh, it's false that P or I should say it's false that P or Q in uh, as any of the premises. But we've got not P and not Q separately. Okay, well let's conjoin them. So we'll take not P and not Q separately. We'll conjoin them together using conjunction and introduction. Then using De Morgan's, that's how we're able to infer the negation of the disjunction. And with the negation of the disjunction, right? Or, or actually, let's just be fancy, right? So I said modus tollens. You can use modus tollens, but since I've shown off equivalence rules, let's use the equivalence rule <laughs> on that conditional and swap it around. So we got if not P or Q, that implies not R. So we infer not R. <coughs> There's lots of different ways to do these proofs. You could just use modus tollens, but I'm wanting to show off the equivalence rules here. So that's why I do that. All right. Well, let's take a look at another problem. All right. So, got not P as a premise. Okay. Then I got a conditional R implies P and Q. And the conclusion is not R. Right. The conclusion is not R. Okay. Uh, well, where's R? R is the antecedent of a conditional. So, we could use modus tollens, or as we just saw, we can use contraposition. <laughs> contraposition. Um, so uh, we got not P, but we don't have Q anywhere. Well, where are we going to, well, if we don't have Q anywhere, where are we going to get? Chances are you have to pull it out of the air, right? <laughs> so we use uh, disjunction introduction with that P. So we got not P or not Q. And now we use De Morgan's to get the negation of the conjunction. And now we got the negation of the conjunction using De Morgan's. Uh, so then we use contraposition again on line two. Again, I'm showing off the equivalence rules. Could use modus tollens, but I'm showing off the equivalence rules. And then using modus ponens, lines four and five, now can infer not R. Okay, last problem. We've got not P disjoined to a disjunction of negations. That's the first premise, not Q or R. Second premise is S or R, if S then R, excuse me. And now we're supposed to apply not P and Q disjoined to not S. Oh boy. There's a lot going on here. Well, if we've got a negation of, look at that conclusion. If you've got a negation, excuse me, a disjunction of negations, might be using, what, uh, disjunction introduction is a possibility? Might be using a uh, dilemma? Might be, now we might be using De Morgan's, right? De Morgan's allows us to deal with disjunctions as, as well. All right, well, let's just keep all these options available to us. Let's just take a look, all right? Uh, so, hmm, not P and Q as one disjunct and not S as the other. Where is that found in the premises? Well, S is the antecedent of a conditional. Well, that might be useful. And if it's the antecedent of a conditional, we're looking for the negation of the antecedent. Well, modus tollens or com uh, a contraposition are in our, or might be in our future. Either one would work. And the other one, we got uh, a large disjunction. We got not P and Q. Does the negation of P and Q is the other as, as another disjunct? Well, that probably might be De Morgan's, right? Because you can't conjoin two negations to get a negation of a conjunction. Uh, so it might be De Morgan's. All right. Well, let, let's try it out. Uh, what sort of disjunction would allow us to get this disjunction? So dilemma is probably in our future here. Dilemma is probably in our future, and since S. Since all the components in the conclusion are already contained in the premises, we're not probably not going to need disjunction introduction. <coughs> um, so what can we do uh, without it? Well, let's try and get the right kind of disjunction. 
association is in our future, right? We want P and Q together on one side and want S on the other. Well, then let's take that first premise and through association get P and Q as one half of a disjunct and S as the other half. Oh, excuse me, uh, 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 R, excuse me, R as the other half, right? All right, so let's go ahead and use the lemma then. Let's assume not P or not Q for the left-handed part of the disjunction. And from that, we can use De Morgan's to infer the negation of the conjunction, not P and Q. Let's use not R for the right-handed part, assume not R for the right-handed part of the disjunction. And keep this in mind with the lemma, if you're gonna assume one half of the dilemma, you gotta assume the other half, right? Remember, you're trying to infer something from both halves, all right? So we got not R for the, for the right-handed part of the disjunction. Well, we got that handy little conditional there. Well, let's go ahead and flip it around using contraposition again. Let's just show off contraposition. We've got if S then R, well, let's turn that into if not R then not S. So using that not R in that conditional, then we can infer S. Right, and we can infer S. So now we have our disjunction that we're looking for the conditional using dilemma. That's going to, that we have in the, the conclusion using dilemma. So we got uh, the, uh, not, the negation of not P and Q, or excuse me, not P and Q disjoint to not S. And how do we get that? Well, look at that. Look at the citation. Line three is where we've got the disjunction. Line four is where we assume the left-handed disjunct. Line five it was get, is where we get our conclusion for the left-handed disjunct, at least the left-handed part of the conclusion for the, for the disjunct. Line six is where we assume the right-handed portion of the disjunct. And then line eight is where we infer the uh, right-handed disjunct and the conclusion. So that we got put that all together, citing our infants rule with the lemma. All right. So that's the last equivalence rule. Let me check my pocket. Yep, that's the last equivalence rule. I think that's all of it. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, with this set of problems, you'll be using combination of equivalence rules and rules of implication. I mean, sometimes, you know, for the test, it might be just implication, might be just equivalence. But uh, you should always think about the uh, possibility of a combination. And when you're doing these problems, Right, so when I give them to you, the, either the formula are filled out or the rules are filled out. Uh, so that's already half the work, right? I've already done half the work for you. You just have to look at, if, if the formulas are filled out, you have to look and say, okay, which rules get you and which lines get you that formula and if the, the rules are filled out, then you have to figure out, okay, what can I infer using these rules and these lines, right? Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's the rules, that's, that's the equivalence rules. Um, probably take a look at some homework problems.